Thank you for joining us at our midweek Bible study this evening. We're just going to continue digging into the Word and looking to Scripture to see if we can't find some, some guidance and some uh, answers that will help us uh, navigate life and, and discover what it truly means to be a disciple of Christ. As we begin our study tonight, uh, we're going to look at a, one particular word, and that is why. Uh, this word can be so infuriating. If you're the parent of a toddler, we know that almost as soon as they learn how to talk, they begin asking why. Why, Mommy? Why, Daddy? Uh, they're not content to just accept things as they are. They, they, they want to know the inner workings. They want to know why the world is the way it is. How do I need to interpret all of these new experiences that I'm having? And, and eventually, uh, that curiosity is channeled into other ways, and, and mom and dad don't have to have all the answers, uh, but humans never seem to stop asking that question, why? Socrates famously said that the unexamined life is, worth li is not worth living, and that goes back to this question of why. If we're not constantly looking at life, looking at circumstances that arise, and, and trying to figure out what's going on behind that, uh, he says that kind of life isn't even worth having. Um, the, 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 even in the Bible, there's an entire book uh, given over to this question of the meaning of life. It, I've been reading lately in, in the book of Ecclesiastes, and the teacher there, he's been trying to figure out, you know, what is the meaning of life? What is the good life? What does it mean to, to live your life under the sun, as he says over and over again? He turns to many different things. He looks to wisdom and knowledge. He looks to, uh, to possessions. He looks to pleasure. He looks to work. He looks to uh, politics. All of these different things he looks at and he, he says, is this the true meaning of life? Is, is this the way things are supposed to be? Is this the reason I was here and the reason I'm on this planet? He's asking himself why over and over and over again. And this follows us throughout our life. And many times when we can't seem to figure out the answers, especially when life hands us some disappointment uh, or some hurt, we get increasingly impatient and we, and we begin to demand an answer to why. Why, God? One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, and it says, I will climb up to my watchtower and I will stand at my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. Now, the reason I love this passage of Scripture is because I'm that stubborn fella. I'm that guy who climbs up on the, on the wall and says, God, I need some answers, and I need them right now. I'm up here on this wall, and I'm not leaving until I get a response. And, uh, and, and so we begin to, to demand our answers even of God. God, why have these things happened in my life? Uh, and and uh, we don't always get the answers that we want. And so that is really the heart of our study tonight. We're going to learn that we don't always get the answers. We will someday, but until then, we must learn to embrace the mystery. So tonight, we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to be looking at the reading out of the New Living Translation. So if you want to turn to that. Um, now, this passage of Scripture, this chapter, is one of the most famous chapters in the Bible. Uh, it's quoted uh, very, very widely. Uh, but we're not looking at the part uh, talking about love, which is the part that usually people talk about. We're going to look a little past that. And we're going to read from verses 9 down through verses 12. It says, Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. Then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Amen. So when we look at this passage of Scripture, Paul is talking about the fact that we just don't have all of the information. Uh, even, even the experts don't have all the answers. Uh, and that's uh, demonstrated no more clearly than in this COVID-19 situation. Uh, people are looking to doctors, people are looking to, uh, to, to uh, researchers, people are looking to politicians. We want the answers. Uh, how many, you know, how dangerous is this disease? What are the things that we can do to mitigate the risk? How long will we have to stay locked down? And the truth is, the human knowledge is incomplete. They just don't have the answers. It doesn't matter who you look to, whether you look to the, the, the president or, or the news media or, or uh, the doctors that work at the CDC, uh, the human knowledge and the human understanding is incomplete. We just don't have all the information we need. And, uh, and, and that's very uncomfortable for us. We want those answers. 
And uh, what we, we, that, that applies outside of just this uh, health crisis. You know, we want answers in every area of our life. We want to know why. We'll sit and we'll ponder why over and over. And what we need to realize is that life, as long as we live it, is going to be an, like an incomplete puzzle. It's going to be a puzzle without all of the pieces in it. Um, now, I'm not a big puzzle person. I used to put some together when I was a child. Um, but I, I just never really liked the digging through and, and trying to put things together. It would get very frustrating at times. And, uh, and that can be the way it is with life. When we, don't, when, when we don't have the piece, that one piece that we're looking for, or when the one piece that we think is the answer, no matter which way we turn it, it doesn't seem to click into place. It doesn't seem to fit the way that we think it should. And, and so, you know, there are some pieces in our life that are going to be missing as long as we're alive. There are some answers that we will never attain on this side of eternity. We must wait for the pieces to come to us as they do, as God reveals himself, and, and then the picture will come into better and better focus, more clarity. We'll be able to see more of the picture. And so that's what it's talking about in verse 9 where it says, Our knowledge is partial and incomplete. And, and it talks about the gift of prophecy. You know, as, as Pentecostal believers, we believe that God speaks to us and that through the Holy Spirit, he guides us. And, and specifically, he's given some of us a gift of prophecy, a gift that can be used to, to encourage and, and inform and edify fellow believers. But even that gift of prophecy, it's not going to give us all the answers. And so we must be, learn to be comfortable with that mystery, uh, with, with that incomplete information. Verse 10 makes reference to a time of perfection when all the pieces are going to fall into place and when the image is finally fully revealed. Now, even in your own life, even if you had all of the answers in your life, you still wouldn't have the complete picture of everything that God is trying to do in the world. Eventually, we will all die. We will reach the end of our life. We'll reach the end of our story and our portion of the puzzle will be complete. But it won't be the complete picture because we don't know what all God plans. Even Jesus shared, you know, that no one knows the day or the time, only the Father. And we have to wait for those things to be revealed to us. And as uncomfortable as it is, we have to learn to wait for that time of perfection. Because all revelation is progressive. You know, it, I was thinking uh, about how... You know, there are things that we think we understand as a young person. And the older we get, we realize that, well, I didn't have all the information. I didn't have all the experience. Um, there are times when, you know, you, you have to take a, a message or a, a, uh, some information and you have to kind of bring it down to the level. Especially anybody who's an educator, you know that you can't just go in and start te teaching uh, algebra to kindergartners. Uh, you don't start there. You start with what they do know. They learn how to count their fingers and toes and how to separate out the beans or, or the buttons or whatever it is you're learning to teach them numerical concepts. And then as they master that information, as they get that under control and they learn that and, and, and internalize it, then you're able to move them on to the next step. And it's the same way with God. God can't give us everything all at once. He starts with us where we are, and then he gives us the next step and the next step and the next step. And, and what that means, though, is that we don't always know the destination. And we don't always know the road that we're going to have to take towards the end. But we have to learn how to trust God through that progressive revelation and understand that as we go through life, he's going to reveal more and more to us. And, and the things that we're concerned with, the questions that we have, will change as we go through different stages of life. Uh, the, the theologian Gordon MacDonald, he talks about this, and, and he kind of broke down the schema of life into a, a set of questions that we ask in each decade of our life. And, and ask, uh, I'm going to read some of these questions and, and ask yourself if this rings true to you. Uh, are the, the questions that he's talking about there, does that match with your experience of life and, and the things that you were concerned with at that stage of life? So he begins with teenagers, and he says that teenagers are caught in the questions of, of who am I and who am I becoming? You know, they don't really even understand fully their identity. They're not sure uh, who is the person, the adult person that they are going to become. And so they're in a process of discovery and exploration and, and deciding who am I going to be in my life. Then as they transition into the, the decade of the 20s, they, they ask, what am I going to do with my life and with whom am I going to do it? 
And so that's where you see people beginning to look at, you know, what, what are my career options? What, what do I want to do with my life? Do I want to travel? Do, what are the things that are important to me? And who are the, the friends and the family members or the partner that I'm going to choose to walk through life together with? And so those are the questions that occupy the 20s. As we move into the 30s, we say that now that I have all of these responsibilities and obligations at this point, you might be well invested into career. You might have uh, a home that you're, you've purchased. You might uh, have a beginning family. You know, now that you have these responsibilities, how do you manage all of these pro uh, priorities? How do I keep everything in balance? How do I keep all the plates spinning? How do I keep all the, uh, the, 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 the balls that I'm juggling up in the air and, and keep it all from crashing down? Then as we move into our 40s, we begin to ask ourselves, how am I doing? Am I a success or am I a failure? Uh, am, am I happy with the progress I'm making? As we move into our 50s, we ask, you know, now that we're in our second half of our life, who is this younger generation coming from, uh, up behind me uh, that wants me out of the way? And how do I cope with some of the disappointments in life? Because, you know, we're all going to experience some of those disappointments. Maybe life didn't turn out the way you expected. You know, maybe, maybe a relationship didn't work out. Maybe uh, your finances haven't worked out the way you planned. Maybe your career goals haven't been achieved at the level that you want. And so as we enter our 50s, we ask those questions. In the 60s, we say, how much longer can I do what defines me? Or is it time to start looking for a change? Um, are, are things going to continue? How long can I continue? At this stage in life, you begin looking at you know, health issues and concerns and, and realizing that you, know, you might not have the, the energy or the vigor that you had when you were once younger or much younger. In the 70s, you begin to ask yourself, how do I deal with loss? Uh, we might begin to look at the loss of, of loved ones, the loss of friends, uh, loss of a partner. Uh, there's a lot of different things that uh, a loss of a career, you know, as you reach that stage in your life, uh, you're asking new questions of yourself. And in the 80s, you might be asking yourself, Do, uh, does anyone remember that person that I once was? Will I be remembered? What is my legacy? What am I leaving behind? And then the one question that follows us no matter the stage of life, that question that will be with us till the very end is what happens to me after I die? And so all of these questions, they haunt us and they leave us asking why, no matter what stage you are in life. And see, that's the, that's the part in verse 12 where uh, Paul's talking about, now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. So we see that these questions are never going to leave us. They're always going to be, they're, they're going to follow us every day of our life as we try to figure out what does it mean to be who I was created to be, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? How do I incorporate this into my life? How do I live my values? How do I live my priorities? Those questions will never go away. We will never have all of the answers, but the response in verse 12 is the one that, uh, that, that, that helps us. And that is that although we don't have the answers, we know the one who does. See, faith is that God has those answers. It says in, in verse 12, God knows me completely. So he knows me. He knows my preferences. He knows my personality. He knows my coping mechanisms. He knows my desires. He knows everything about who I am. He knows my motivations. He knows my intentions. He knows what I desi desire to, to, uh, to do in, in relationships with others. He knows what I uh, desire to do in my uh, desire to, to make a difference in the world. God knows everything about you because he's the one who created you. And so that is where the faith steps in. Even though I don't have all the answers, God does. He has the blueprint. He knows where this is going. And then, so that, that's the faith aspect of it. Next, we look at the hope. The hope is that God will eventually fully reveal his plan and his purpose for your life. He doesn't leave us uh, just uh, wandering around. Sometimes we don't like the answers. Sometimes the answers don't come as quickly as we want them. But God is not leaving you blindfolded and deafened in the dark. He's trying to give you guidance. He's trying to show you the way. And so that's where faith and hope steps in. But chapter 13 of, of 1 Corinthians, it ends with this famous verse. And you've probably heard it many times. But it says, three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. 
See, this, this passage talking about the why and the wondering and the mystery and the, the, the confusion and not understanding everything perfectly, it comes in a context of love. And that context of this passage is also the response that guides us. That is love. Even though we don't have all the answers, when we're trying to figure out what should I do, our default response should not be distrust. It should not be concern or worry or anxiety. Our, our default response should not be anger or self-preservation. Our default response should not be, uh, uh, you know, trying to fix things ourselves. The, re the response, the context for this passage is the response. It is love. So even though you don't understand why things worked out the way they did, if you will respond in love, then it will move you down that path and take you to the place where you want to be. You know, all of our goal as disciples is to be made more and more like Christ, more and more like our Father. And if you read in John, it defines him, especially in, in 1 John, it talks about how God is love. It defines who he is. And so when we choose a response of love to whatever circumstances, even when we don't understand them, then we are becoming more and more like our Father. So, um, when we ask ourselves, why did I get fired? You might not have the answer, but if you will respond in love. Why can't my, 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 my spouse and I ever seem to get along? Respond out of love. You know, why can't my finances work out? Why, why are these investments that I made? Or why can't I ever seem to get ahead? Or why can't I never seem to live within my means? Respond out of love. You know, why, why is my child struggling the way it is, uh, 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 the way he or she is? Why can't I figure out how to support him and, and, or her and, and be the person that they need to succeed in life? Respond out of love. See, the context forms the response even when you don't have the answer. I'll be honest, there's many times in my life where I didn't have answers. There's been many nights where I laid in my bed, tossing and turning, praying and asking God, why? Why is this situation the way it is? Why, uh, why am I hurting the way I am? Why can I not seem to, to find the path forward? And, um, you know, I, I just don't believe that that's what God desires for us. You know, his, he, obviously he's not wanting to shut down your questions. See, God's big enough to, to, to field any question that you might have in life. Um, and eventually you will get your answer. But while you're uncomfortable, while you're in between, while you're still waiting on God to fully reveal himself, if you will learn to respond to everything out of love, then, then you will uh, learn how to live with and embrace the mystery and, and, and just say, look, I don't have all the answers. You know, when, when I was younger, um, I was a pretty good student. I, I, I did pretty well in school, and, and I'm pretty good at, at memorizing trivia facts, those sorts of things. And so uh, school came pretty easily to me. Uh, and, and I got to a place where I enjoyed being that guy who had all the answers. Uh, you know, I had random useless facts uh, piled away in my mind. Uh, and very useful when you're playing something like Trivial Pursuit or Jeopardy. Um, but... but the older I've gotten, the more I've realized that I don't have all the answers. I might know some trivia. Uh, I, I might know some, some useless information, right? Uh, but I don't have all the answers. And the older I get, the more comfortable I get saying, you know, I don't know. Let, you know, asking, asking Siri for some answers or, or looking to, to Google or Wikipedia, that, that gets easier and easier the older you get because you're like, look, I can't know everything about everything. Uh, that, that's just the way it is. And, and so we learn to grow comfortable and embrace the mystery of not knowing. And again, that's not trying to say that God doesn't want us to use our minds, that God doesn't want us to apply ourselves in study of Scripture, uh, that God doesn't want us to explore uh, nature or, or try to answer questions that as they come up. But we have to understand that sometimes we're just not going to have all those answers and learn to be comfortable in that. This has been a time... Of, of great worry and anxiety in, in our nation, uh, in our world, uh, as people don't know what's going on fully. 
We, we get our news reports. We try to follow along. We try to follow the guidelines that are given to us by, by the authorities. We try to, to, to navigate the situations, uh, whether it's uh, reduced employment, uh, lack of income, uh, difficulty trying to continue to ed educate our children with lack of schooling and support. Um, there's a lot of different things that we just don't have the answer to. And so, you know, it has created a, a firestorm of worry and anxiety. And it, I really believe it, it's, it's gripped the heart of our nation. And I think that if we can just learn to, to accept the fact that we're not going to have all the answers, but we know the one who does. See, the church has, has been uh, given a great opportunity to step up. Um, you know, I was talking with another pastor this week about the fact that, you know, it's, it's almost like this situation has kick-started a lot of churches and, and pushed us uh, to a place where we can say, look, I'm just a, another human like you are. I'm just another, you know, I'm, I'm just another person trying to navigate through life the best I can. I don't have all the answers. But we can look to the world and as a witness say, although I don't have the answers... I know who does. I'm a child of the king. I'm a child uh, and, 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 and a follower of Christ. And so although I don't have the answers, God does. And that if we will look to him instead of to ourselves, if we will look to him instead of to experts, and if we will respond out of our uncertainty, out of love, then we will navigate everything that, uh, that, that life can throw at us. And we will eventually reach that place where God is able to reveal everything fully to us. I look forward to that day. There's so many things. Uh, I, I know I shared last week that, that I really didn't look forward to going to heaven as a child. It didn't sound like a whole lot of fun to me uh, because I've been in some of those Pentecostal church services that lasted three hours. You know, it, it just, it, it was a little too much for me. I couldn't sit still that long. But I'm telling you that now I look forward to getting to heaven. I look forward to that day where I can see things clearly, when I can have those answers that I've searched for all my life. When I can sit down with my, my father and say, explain to me, what was going on in my life? What were you trying to do uh, in this circumstance? What, what were you trying to, to show me? What were you trying to push me towards? And, and, and eventually the, the, the picture will uh, stop being fuzzy. It'll pop into perfect focus. And man, I, I look forward to that someday. I look forward to sitting down with some of my heroes in the faith, uh, people that I've read their biographies or, or people from scripture that I've read about my whole life. I look forward to sitting down with them and asking them some questions, you know, because the, the Sometimes you don't get the full story. And so I look forward to, to exploring that. But most of all, I look forward to that day where I don't have to be haunted by this question of why. And I don't have to embrace mystery anymore. I don't have to embrace uh, not knowing and, and understand, not understanding and uncertainty. But I can look to my Father and I can thank Him. And so... That's my challenge for you this week. As, as you go through this situation with, with COVID or, or uh, employment changes or financial strain or relational strain or, or whatever challenges you're navigating right now in your life, I just want to say, don't try to, to beat your head against the wall trying to figure out the why. You might not find it out. I'm sure that God will speak to you during this time of difficulty. He will reveal himself. I found that when I'm going through struggles, God reveals himself more clearly at those times than any other. And I don't think it's because God is doing more to speak to me. I think it's because in those times of difficulty, that's when I'll shut up long enough to actually sit down and listen because I realize that I don't have all the answers. And so if we will approach God from that standpoint, he will speak to us and he will guide us and he will get us through this. So I want to pray for each of us, and then we'll close out this Bible study today. Father God, we just thank you for our, the, the opportunity to study Scripture together once again. I'm amazed at the level of technology that allows us to, to stay in contact, to stay in touch, even though we, we have to be physically separate. Lord, I'm so grateful for all of those advances that have made it possible. Lord, as our country, as this world tries to navigate this situation of, of a viral outbreak that is threatening the lives of thousands of people, Lord, we, we've asked ourselves why over and over. Why do the schools have to be shut down? Why did my place of work have to be shut down? Why am I uh, having to struggle to get by financially as my sources of income are cut off? 
Lord, why are some people uh, hit by this virus and it, and, it, 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 and, and it takes their very lives? It affects them so greatly while others uh, are barely even affected. They don't show any symptoms. Lord, there's a lot of why questions floating around. And humans, we, we just don't have the answers. It's creating worry and anxiety. And so, Father God, I pray that you would comfort those who are uh, in, in the throes of that anxiety. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come and be a, a calming balm, a, a calming presence in those people's lives. Lord, help us to calm down and to realize that if we will respond out of love, and if we will look to you with faith and with hope, Lord, that, that we don't have to, to, to be uh, anxious, we don't have to be fearful anymore, we can trust you. And so, Father, I pray that you would just be with uh, everyone who's been a part of this Bible study, whether they're, um, you know, watching at home, whether they're listening uh, on, on YouTube or, or uh, while they're out for a drive. Lord, wherever they are, I pray that your Holy Spirit would begin to speak into their heart, Lord, and help them understand that even though they might not have all the answers to why, they can rely on you, and you do have all those answers. And one day you promise that you will make it clear to us. And we praise you, and we thank you. You are so good to us. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. As we close today, I just want to remind you all that uh, we are going to begin this process of reopening. Uh, Church at Spirit Life over the next few weeks is going to look a little different, uh, so stay in touch. Uh, I know pastors already put out one video with some instructions, some guidelines. We're going to try to do a drive-in service this Sunday, uh, so we want to encourage everybody, if you are comfortable and if you are able to join us in the parking lot, we're going to do everything we can to make that uh, process seamless for you. Um, and, but don't worry, if you're unable to come uh, or if it won't work for you or for your family, uh, we will still be live streaming the service and so you can join us that way. Uh, either way, whether you're here in person in your car or, or whether you're watching uh, at another time, I believe we're going to be taking communion. So go ahead and make preparations to have those communion elements available. And uh, I look forward to seeing some of you on Sunday. It's been far too long. And so uh, as we walk through this process, thank you for your patience. Thank you uh, for your trust in your pastor and, and the staff here as we've tried to do everything we could to serve you during this time uh, of upheaval and, and this, uh, it, it, uh, this very uh, difficult and interesting and unusual time. We love you all, and we'll see you on Sunday.